an Ukrainian public intellectual. He's also a lecturer at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, Ukraine, teaching courses that explain Ukraine's social transformation and cultural and institutional transformation as well to overcome colonial legacy. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. Good evening from Uganda's capital, Kampala. It's a pleasure having you this evening. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Well, I don't know if they have showed you the audience in the room. It would be beautiful for you to see the number of people in the room so you know who you'll be speaking to. Uh, yeah, these are some of the people in the room. So we're at the American Center and we've been having these dialogues. Literally, this is the fifth episode, really trying to interface um, realities that are happening here in Uganda but as well as those that are, are happening in Ukraine. First off, we'll of course also introduce Mr. Quest Tabaro, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Leo Institute. It's good to have you, sir. Thank you for accepting to come. Thank you, Solomon. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing your insights. First off, today, global leaders are meeting in uh, Indonesia to really speak about the situation in Ukraine. That's a G20 summit. <laughs> We have been notified that President Putin did, did not make a show, so he did not turn up. He sent his foreign affairs minister, Sergei Ravrov, and the prime minister for, of UK put it in his face that the war needs to end. Of course, Ukraine is on top of the agenda, the G20 summit. So first off, let's start with what's happening in Ukraine. What is the latest on this war? Uh, normally, that's my first question, so that we can really get a feel of what you are going through in Ukraine, and perhaps to catch up with what's the latest. So, even could you bring us up to speed with the latest from Ukraine? Well, this is a colonial war. For Ukraine, this is an independence war. Ukraine has been conquered by Russia for centuries. And uh, throughout all of this time, Ukrainians have been fighting to uh, become independent. Formally, Ukraine proclaimed independence 1991. But in fact, Russians kept informal control of Ukraine's institution for another 20 years. Uh, Ukraine has uh, gotten rid of Russian influence uh, in uh, 2014. And that was exactly the moment when the Russian-Ukraine war started. The Russians annexed Crimea and uh, part of the Eastern Ukrainian territories. And um, they started a full-scale invasion on 24th of February. And that's exactly where the top-down Russian hierarchy uh, smashed and uh, was disrupted by the network nature of the Ukrainian society. Uh, Ukrainian society and Ukrainian resistance is very much grassroots driven, whereas Russian uh, offensive is very much uh, hierarchical. And um, Ukraine prevails. Ukraine has just liberated one of the major cities um, uh, in south of Ukraine. And it looks like uh, Ukraine has the opportunity to win this war militarily. Uh, this is not only a defeat for Russia, this is also a defeat for autocracies, this is also a defeat for um, uh, imperial powers. Um, Ukraine becoming a member of the European Union has very uneasy conversations with uh, the former European colonial powers, because Ukraine basically requires that Germany, France and other former European empires um, recognize Ukraine's agency in full. Uh, so in this sense, um, I think um, the Ukrainian uh, resistance uh, could be explained in terms of other nations that are fighting for recognition, that are fighting for their own agency. And um, uh, just to wrap up, I'll say that uh, it's incredible that um, we have the opportunity to talk directly. Uh, and uh, it's incredible that we have the opportunity to try and find the terms and the language that we all understand. Because I think, at least from our perspective, it seems that 
we are um, continuing the same struggle and we are continuing um, the same effort uh, to uh, be visible, to be recognized, uh, to have our own dignity protected. Um, today, President Zelensky asked the G20 summit to support Ukraine and indeed to put an end to this war. Is the end to this war in sight? Um, yes and no. Um, if Ukraine stops right now, if we stop the fighting, this will not be the end of the war. Uh, the war was started by the uh, Russian imperial forces and it will continue as long as Russia stays in empire. So basically, if we want the end for the war, Russia has to become a nation state, uh, not a colonial power. Uh, so that means that Russia has to be transformed from within. Ukraine has no ambition to go into the Russian territory. So from the Ukrainian perspective, the end of war is as long as we um, regain the sovereignty over 100% of our territory. Uh, so there will be quite a huge task on behalf of Ukraine, but also international community to assist uh, the Russian transformation. Uh, the defeat for Russia is uh, probably a key thing for the transformation to start within the Russian society. So far, we see that the Russians are shocked by the fact that they cannot uh, win militarily. They were expecting that their army would be much more superior to Ukraine's uh, army. It turns out to be an inferior army. Ukrainian army is modern. It's um, a protective of human life. Um, we care for the lives of our soldiers. We care for the lives of our um, people. Therefore, Ukraine has introduced completely new warfare tactics. Uh, Ukrainian warfare strategy is a modern strategy. Russian strategy is an outdated strategy. What we basically learned, we learned that a free country is more efficient than a country that is not free. So um, for us to end it all, um, basically has two stages. Stage one, Russia is out of Ukraine. Stage two, there is transformation inside Russia. I would say that there is also stage three, which is important, that in the meantime, other countries that are looking at Russia, hoping that if Russia is successful, they can be successful in their own um, wars, uh, that they do not start the wars. And uh, so I would say that Ukraine's victory on the battlefield means more peace for everyone on the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, I need to add that all of us um, globally are saddened by what's happening in Ukraine. We have been following the situation in Mariupol and you know, the mass graves, family divided, homes destroyed, businesses you know, destroyed. Um, it's really sad what's happening there. And indeed, we'll talk about the cultural and social movements that are coming up in Ukraine to push back on the war. Um, but let, let, me, let me come home here, Quiz. I mean, what is happening in Ukraine is happening. Um, I think Uganda has gone through war um, so many times. War is terrible. Um, and it's in the transformation process. You know, we, you know, so many to fight, fight against authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, human rights abuses. And what we've seen is a growing movement of, you know, people, everyone who is concerned about the situations that are going on, not only globally, but also locally. And so we've seen people who we never saw at the front line of activism coming up in their different spaces, social, cultural spaces to push back against evils in society. And I wanted to tap into your thoughts around the evolution of this and where we are with that. You know, many of us know Bobby Wine, right? Robert Chagulani, who is a prominent political figure for you, uh, even, I mean, he was a musician, but also speaking about issues that were concerning to the people. His music came to the front, did hit after hit, speaking about, speaking about issues that were affecting to the people. And before, I never thought musicians actually could come out and sing against, you know, pushing back on evils, but what we've seen is, is exactly that. So we, we wanted to really walk us the journey 
you know, from the historical perspective to where we are and whether this is something that people in Ukraine can pick up if they're not already doing it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Solomon, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, Yvonne. I look forward to learning more about uh, what's happening in Ukraine. And uh, thanks to everyone who made time to attend uh, uh, today's conversation. I'm happy to have in the audience uh, Mze Nyanzi. I don't know if he remembers me, but uh, we took a bus ride to Nairobi uh, a couple of years ago. Must have been in uh, 2015. Oh, yesterday, oh, yeah. <laughs> for a young man, that's a, almost a quarter of my life. But uh, yes, we uh, we took a long bus ride to Nairobi uh, about seven years ago and uh, talked about a range of things. Interesting among the things we discussed was uh, art in Uganda, um, and he's one of the you know still living pioneers. So I'm very happy. I didn't expect you to be in the audience, but... Uh, as luck would have it, I, I have a thing or two that uh, you know will really attract your attention. So, uh, Solomon, when um, you know you reached out to me about uh, this conversation on the arts and social change, and even in your introduction, I felt in my presentation it's, it's very important to not only discuss the present, but also discuss how do we get to the present uh, that we see today. You said that we've seen emerging social movements that were never seen before. Um, that's actually not very accurate. Um, these social movements have always been there in peace times, in uh, wartime when Uganda was at war, even in times when Uganda was going through the terrible dictatorship of uh, Idi Amin. So I tried to trace them in my uh, brief presentation, which I, I wrote down and hopefully I'll share with the center to give an, uh, each and every one of you. So. I started arbitrarily with uh, the year 2010 to try and uh, make my point as to how did Uganda get to where it is today and uh, you know, have a country now where you know, being an artist is no longer about performing on stage, but you have someone like Bobby White, who is a, you know, a national symbol. So if you look at uh, the year 2010, it was, uh, was really interesting. Um, Uganda was one year away from the 2021, the 2011. Uh, general election in which uh, President Museveni was seeking a fourth term, depending on who was counting fourth elective term or sixth term, because uh, the first two terms from 86 to, to 96 were, were unelected. But then around the same time, uh, I think this is uh, mid-2010, uh, there was a song that, that came out and really shook the airwaves in Uganda. And uh, this was a song by then upcoming artist, uh, now very famous, called uh, Eddie Kenzo. And the song was Stamina. Now, if you listen to Stamina and the dances around uh, Stamina, you'd be very captivated. And indeed, many people tried to draw the connection and say, maybe this song has been commissioned by President Museveni ahead of his campaign in 2011 to say that he still has Stamina and is willing to, uh, to serve another term. Of course, uh, we, we later found out this uh, was not uh, the truth because the president uh, went ahead in the same election to also embrace the arts and music, and he gave us a, a rap single, Penkoni. I don't know if many in the audience uh, remember it, which again captivated uh, a large number of uh, of young Ugandans. Of course, while all this was uh, happening uh, on the music scene, artists were also beginning to, you know, reorganize themselves and uh, see where they lie. So we had some of them like uh, Bebe Cool aligning with the president's campaign. He was always on the campaign trail and he was really the voice of the artist um, reaching out to the other side in the, in the NRM. But of course, uh, strangely quiet in all this was uh, uh, a young man then called uh, Bobby Wine who had uh, seemed to stick to his uh, music and uh, stayed uh, away from uh, the politics of the day. But in the lead up to to the election, uh, we also saw uh, Bobby Wine jump into the fray by releasing a song, Obululu. I don't know if uh, many in the audience have listened to it. Yes, Obululu trying, uh, which was released in uh, late 2010 when the campaigns had already started. And through the song, he cautioned people to remain peaceful in uh, that election that was very tense, uh, featuring President Museveni and uh, his perennial challenger, uh, Dr. Kiza Besije. 
Of course, this would not be the first time that uh, Bobby Wine was using a national event to venture into social commentary. Earlier on in uh, 2005, as we were preparing for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2007, uh, Bobby Wine had composed a popular song, Ghetto, uh, in which he addressed issues of the common person and felt that the common person was only being consulted by politicians when they needed uh, their votes. He also had a string of other songs, uh, including uh, uh, To Gambia to, to Jennifer, uh, about uh, the role that uh, KCCA was playing in uh, uh, chasing people off the, the, the streets and uh, pavements. So when all this was uh, uh, was happening, of course, between this is 2010, between 2010 and 2018, really, when uh, Bobby Wine uh, stood for political office in uh, in Chadondo, he was known more for the musician that he was. But in 2018, something changed significantly, and uh, Bobby Wine became a national politician. So when we're trying to understand this, my, my work, uh, as uh, Solomon introduced me, I work at the Leo Africa Institute, we're a leadership training and development organization. We run a publication called the Leo Africa Review, uh, which is a magazine for culture, politics, and uh, social affairs. So I tasked, uh, I was the editor of uh, our publication then, I tasked uh, a Ugandan arts journalist called Andrew Kagwa, I told him, you know, this uh, young man, this was July 2019, uh, this young man, Bobby Wine, um, is making moves here and there. There had already been a fight, I, I think, in Parliament. Um, Arua had happened. So I wanted him to profile uh, Bobby Wine and not just talk, talk about him as the emerging politician that he was, which was what everyone was talking about, but to try and understand uh, and trace the roots of his uh, activism that uh, started in the ghettos of Kamocha in the 90s. And indeed, uh, Kagwa did not disappoint. Um, he did a wonderful piece uh, that was uh, 2000, about 2,500 words uh, long, so quite lengthy for, for a publication. And in this piece, he traced the origins of uh, Bobby Wine's uh, activism um, and went on to describe uh, Bobby Wine as, as follows. And I, I'd encourage you to to get time and, uh, and read that article on the Leo Africa Review. It's called The Evolution of Bobby Wine. So he said that um, uh, he described Bobby Wine as a, an artist who had styled his career as one filled with a lot of responsibility for the downtrodden. And when he was not declaring himself president of the underprivileged people of the ghettos, he, he called himself uh, the, uh, the ghetto president, he was rallying uh, fellow artists to grow up and end fights. And you know, you've had. Uh, uh, the songs uh, Dipo Nazik Gala and uh, things like that. So few of the people who confront Bobby Wine today as uh, the leader of the National Unity Platform uh, make reference to that background as, as an activist. His activism did not start 10 years ago. It can really be traced to uh, perhaps uh, the mid to, to, to late 90s. And indeed, fewer still uh, give enough credit to him for his... Uh, deep-rooted interest in the plight of the downtrodden people, which was the hallmark of his music. If you go back and listen to all his songs, there was always that element of championing causes of the, of the poor, the forgotten, and of course, uh, issues of, uh, uh, of justice. And many of you will recall uh, the lyrics in uh, one of Bobby Wine's songs in, that was released in uh, 2012. Uh, I think it's called By Far, Bad Man By Far. He said, uh, and this, uh, remember this time he has not even ventured into politics. He said, uh, and, and I quote him, my father said there's more politics in the music industry than in parliament. Forgive them, father. They don't know who them deal with, who they, uh, who they deal with anyway. We, we are a bad man and we don't fear intimidation. That's why we sit top of the nation from Dangala Kamocha, where we come from. This is a new one for you. Quite interesting when you read it in the Times because it felt like he was predicting uh, the kind of future role uh, he would play. I've not had chance to interview him, but I'd be, you know, really interested to know whether there was any linkage between his lyrics ten years ago and his eventual uh, entrance uh, into politics. Of course, depending on which political side uh, you fall today, whether you consider Bobby Wine's 
politics or the politics generally in Uganda uh, to be div divisive. I think as an individual, as an artist, as a social commentator, uh, Bobby Wine stands out as a consistent champion of the interests of the poor and a champion of justice. And indeed, as we've seen recently, truly a national symbol of uh, resistance. I don't know at, uh, when uh, Yvonne gets the opportunity to speak, whether there are examples or parallels that can be drawn in uh, Ukraine, but that would be my assessment of one uh, artist in Uganda, and that is uh, Bobby Wine. Now, my presentation is split into three or four parts. So I started with the music and uh, focused on Bobby Wine, uh, Eddie Kenzo. Uh, the next part will uh, focus on the arts, um, whether it's uh, cartoonists or the the painting uh, art. All right, we will start oh, from there perfect. now. So maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll... we'll get to the to the arts now. Um, even yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. That that's quite a good backgrounding. Um, uh, we've not talked about there the people like the Alex Mukulus. Oh, I think they are in there, but we'll we'll get to that. Even let me come to you. You've had it from uh, Quezia trying to you know, take us back history and how, you know, arts and, and, and social movements are coming up to push back against uh, social evils. What is it like in Ukraine, especially um, from this war? Are we seeing, you know, artists coming out to really condemn the war? What is the situation like in Ukraine? Well, let me start with uh, another parallel. Um, actually, our president, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, is of artistic background. He was a stand-up comedian, um, and uh, he was uh, actually someone who would uh, be pretty political in his uh, art. Uh, and uh, eventually, he became a star of a uh, television series. And then uh, he played a president uh, who he played a school teacher who became president of uh, Ukraine, and then. At a certain point, he decided that he actually wants to turn that script into reality. And he had a absolutely smashing win uh, at the um, electoral polls. The previous president uh, of Ukraine didn't see it coming. Uh, and um, so uh, it's from the Ukrainian perspective, it's understandable how a artist can play an important role in politics. But I would uh, took a wider um, look at this situation uh, through the last hundred years when uh, the Russians were trying to wipe out Ukrainian language, wipe out Ukrainian identity. It was basically the activism of people in arts, starting from music, songs, pop culture, going into um, paintings and uh, other visual arts who actually were at the core of the resistance. And um, it was very difficult uh, for the um, Soviet government to make sure that Ukrainian um, uh, culture is contained. Basically, the Soviet uh, system allowed only certain uh, manifestations of Ukrainian culture, uh, and the other manifestations were deemed to be anti-Soviet and uh, and were not uh, allowed to be practiced freely. Uh, and, but then if you have a songwriter whose songs become so popular that millions of people sing them, uh, any oppressive government can do very little about it. During this war, one of the things that we noticed was the incredible war of memes. Uh, Ukrainians would produce these memes uh, in incredible uh, numbers. Uh, and that would be, again, grassroots movement, where a lot of people would make uh, cartoons, would make uh, short videos for TikTok or for other social uh, networks. And then they would become viral and go and uh, energize millions. And um, these uh, um, uh, contents basically were used for um, to mobilize people to uh, help crowdfund uh, um, money for refugees, 
uh, help um, get uh, the shelters uh, uh, built or uh, help rebuild, for instance, uh, the houses that were destroyed uh, on liberated ter territories. Uh, so um, um, this is the war of means, the war of culture, as much as this, as this is the war of um, uh, armaments for, for, for Ukraine. So I would second very much that um, uh, culture is basically uh, just another reflection of um, uh, our life. And, uh, you know, if, if we have an existential threat, then it's reflected in culture. If we are happy, then it's reflected in culture. If we are uh, saddened by something, then it's reflected in culture. So um, it's, it's really important that uh, we have all of the um, sectors of our lives combined into, into, into one single stream. And uh, cultural resistance for us is just as important as military resistance on the battlefield. Wow, what a way to bridge it. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. You know, it's uh, quite interesting listening to the, to the parallels. And I've just limited my, my scope to the last 20 or so years. But I'm sure if we went back into the, our own anti-colonial struggle, we could still draw very many uh, interesting parallels. Indeed, you talk about uh, cultures as a tool of uh, resistance, which is precisely my next example, where, again, I look at uh, three individuals, uh, Chris Ogon, uh, who is a cartoonist with the Daily Monitor, Jimmy Spire Sentongo, uh, who is uh, an academic, but also a cartoonist with uh, The Observer, and another artist uh, who prefers to call himself Quiz Era, but his name is Quiz Era. Um, in, uh, two, in the same year, I think July uh, 2019, uh, our publication uh, ran a series called uh, When Art Speaks, focusing on uh, emerging voices in, in, on the art scene in Uganda and uh, the role of uh, artists as, as voices for, for society. And I remember as editor of the publication, then hosting um, a panel with uh, Chris Gone. Uh, Hilary Mugizi. Hilary is, uh, he uses the name Izzy, E-Z-I. I'm sure you've seen his paintings. He's done a wonderful uh, painting of uh, the Kabaka that was presented to him on his uh, birthday. Um, I also talked to Daniel Lagen, who is another Ugandan artist from Northern Uganda. Um, Alex Quizera, the, uh, the gentleman behind Quizera, and um, another young lady uh, at Makere called uh, Rita Saken. But of the people that I talked to, you know, one I found uh, Chris Ogon quite uh, fascinating. Uh, even I don't know if you've had chance to to look up Chris Ogon online, but uh, he's uh, he's a cartoonist with one of the the leading independent dailies uh, that comes out here in Uganda, who stands out for his critical commentary on uh, on national politics uh, without writing a single sentence or word, uh, but just using his. Uh, his cartoons. And when I, I interviewed him, I remember him saying that, uh, and I quote him, art is the best form available for one to express him or herself, uh, he told me then. And indeed, if you look at our media in Uganda, uh, media landscape over the last uh, 10 years, uh, and I'm sure Solomon will speak to it, he, he works with the Media Training Institute, but there's been a growing uh, level of censorship, uh, that is from the center, whether it's uh, through laws uh, enacted by, by the state or through attacks um, uh, on, the, on the free press. But also, sadly, increasingly from even within the newsroom, there is uh, increasing self-censorship. Um, I know you've seen many of our leading journalists who have ended up becoming spokespersons of government agencies, of international NGOs, of you know, multilateral organizations. So that opportunity alone um, there, uh, uh, reduces the kind of uh, quality journalists that we would have in the newsroom. It takes away the experience from the newsroom, but also in a way it conditions those journalists who are still in the newsroom today to go slow on questioning power because then maybe it will increase their chances of getting employed in those institutions they're supposed to hold to account on behalf of the public. And I think that's a very perhaps even greater than the uh, the censorship that comes from uh, the government through laws and 
you know, physical attacks on journalists. I think the biggest threat is that the the incentives that exist to draw away uh, journalists from from doing their uh, journalism work. But uh, you know, in an environment like this, cartoonists like uh, Chris Ogon and uh, Jimmy Spire this, at uh, the Observer stand out as critical voices that continue to hold public officials to account. And uh, I don't have any scientific evidence, but my own suspicion uh, is that probably more Ugandans interact with Chris Ogon's cartoons than with the Daily Monitor newspaper in which the cartoons <laughs> are, are published. Many of you may know what Chris Ogon recently published two days ago, but you may not know what the headline was in the, uh, in the Daily Monitor today. And I think that speaks to the evolving nature of uh, media in Uganda. So Chris Ogon's cartoons are not just in the physical paper, but whenever they come out, he also publishes them online on his uh, social media channels. And I think uh, this contributes to the wider spread. So eventually they make it to WhatsApp statuses, they make it to people's Facebook posts. Um, some of them are, are animated and then they appear in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in TikTok videos. Some of them have even been shared outside of Uganda. And I think that's uh, the important role that, uh, that people like uh, Chris Ogon and, uh, and Jimmy Spire St. Tongo do, that it might, because of the nature of uh, their art, it's, it's very difficult to even you know, use the existing laws on our books to say <laughs> they've, uh, uh, what, is the, what is the offense uh, that you're usually charged with? Sedition? <laughs> <laughs> publication of false news, uh, defamation, and things like that, because they, he doesn't have to write a single word. He will just draw something. He may not even you know, attach Solomon's name to Solomon's cartoon, but anyone who sees the cartoon will certainly know that uh, it's uh, Solomon. So it's an interesting art form. And I think uh, people like uh, Chris Ogon and, and, uh, and, and uh, Jimmy Spire St. Tongo should be celebrated for their bravery uh, to draw on paper what uh, journalists cannot put in words in the same newspaper. Of course, uh, you know, uh, to, to borrow on, uh, on uh, you know, the words of veteran Ugandan journalist Charles Nyangobo, who had many run-ins with, uh, with the state when he used to edit the, uh, the Daily Monitor. He describes uh, the kind of art form that, uh, uh, that Ogon and, uh, and Spire um, do in their, in their work, and he calls it... Uh, making stinging statements about our politics, um, assessments of important social movements, and testaments about the national economy and mood in a way that a writer journalist would not, uh, unless he wants to find himself in jail or in certain cases, um, even in exile. And of course, uh, the discomfort that uh, people like uh, Chris Ogon and Jimmy Spire, maybe Quizera, um, impact on the powerful, is I think greater than any article that could be written by 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 an art, uh, by by a journalist, but also I, I think even greater than any poem that could be written by Stella Nyanzi, who ended up you know landing in jail for for her written words. So that's what makes the the, the art of uh, uh, you even had memes, but in Uganda I think cartoons. That's what makes it very powerful that you you just can't control the message yeah and certainly you yeah. just can't you. because many of us when we buy newspapers that's you know we always go to that cartoon side to look at what is Ogon saying but i think with the presence of the online platforms i think sometimes uh, you know i've had um from a friend that sometimes chris Ogon draws cartoons which even the daily monitor fears to publish um, but but then he puts them on his own platform and we can go and find on his page his latest cartoon. But when you check in the newspapers, it's not there and we consume it because then we are able to download it, share it, laugh about it. But then the point is actually made. The president has on several times complained about him being drawn in cartoons and, and, and he has said, well, you even put me in cartoons but I, have, I don't do anything to you. And the power of, 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 of cartoons is so strong that in some countries, you're not even accepted to draw a leader 
in cartoons. I think uh, President Paul Kagame doesn't like to be drawn in cartoons um, in, in Rwanda. You, you, you really want to be very strong to draw President Paul Kagame in a, in a cartoon. And, and, and so what, like what you're saying, Chris, I can't agree more with you. Um, I mean, even in the government newspapers, like Russ, you know, Mr. Russ, um, who also sometimes, you know, yes, it's a government newspaper, but falls back to it and, you know, draws that every element in that cartoon has an explanation. Many of us just laugh about it, but we try to get into the mind of the person who drew the cartoon. Jimmy Spire always puts a bottle. <laughs> and I, I've always wondered, you know, with a drop of yellow, uh, you know, I, I always try to, hey, what is it? You know, in every, in every cartoon he does, he always, in there is a lot of communication and that can be used as a tool for um, advocacy and activism, right? I think my favorite, was when um, you know uh, he uh, Chris Ogon drew a cow, you know, with the presidential advisor turning up for duty, um, and and that was amazing. I mean, we have a pre even we have a presidential advisor on cattle, who actually earns about fifteen million. But yeah, so um, that that was depicted in a cartoon, and we laughed about it. But the point was made home. So. I just wanted to come back to you. In terms of music, have we had some, um, you know, Ukrainian artists united against this war and releasing songs and and being part of 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 the pushback um, and the aggression on Ukraine by Russia? It was amazing how many new songs uh, were recorded in the first days of war. Uh, it uh, looked like a competition, basically, between the artists who would do uh, a new song. And the, the, uh, there would be a lot of videos from the front lines um, shot by the, filmed by the uh, soldiers or the videos from the drones. So they would usually take the footage from the front lines and uh, uh, use the music to uh, both inspire the people uh, but also allow them to express what they felt. Uh, and um, I, was, I was amazed with the amount of, um, of this new music because um, Ukraine has been uh, rising uh, slowly um, uh, from, uh, you know, in this anti-colonial uh, scene. Um, when we started in the 90s, Probably we would have, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 10, 15, 20 albums a year that would be released of new music. At this point, I cannot keep track of this. It's, it's just beyond uh, um, my ability to, to track uh, the new release, releases. Uh, so music was very important uh, for uh, mobilization. Music was very important for resistance. Um, there was a lot of new rap, a lot of new pop, a lot of new rock. Uh, so, you know, you name the style and there will be a few representatives who would have their, uh, as I would say, I would call it war songs um, that they uh, created. But also there was part of the Ukrainian scene that joined the Russians and um, and they were also trying to uh, reflect uh, their mood, uh, only that they never felt this, they never enjoyed this instant popularity. So they were heavily promoted by the propaganda channels, but they could not gain the viral support on the social networks and um, uh, they could not um, uh, have this instant penetration you know, into millions of accounts. Uh, so, yes, I would say music is extremely important. Basically, you know, um, you probably know it as well as we know it. When you're the underdog and when you are fighting the colonial power, um, culture is weaponized. Culture is the carrier of the message. And, uh, you know, you use any tools there is to your, you know, disposal. You use music, you use cartoons, you use... Uh, other forms of visual art 
Um, and uh, in that sense, I think um, uh, Ukraine has been the place where people would turn very creative into how they would express themselves. And uh, you would see uh, short clips, you would see uh, music videos, you would see new songs recorded. Uh, you would have a lot of a cappella singing on the streets where people would just sing songs. Um, also, we had an attempt 100 years ago. Ukraine tried to become independent. That independence was crushed. Uh, basically, we paid a very heavy price with millions of victims uh, after that attempt. And a lot of the songs that were sung by our independence heroes 100 years ago have been revived now. And then one of the things that we were surprised with was that some of them have gone international. For instance, Pink Floyd, which is a big rock band. Uh, played one of the Ukrainian uh, resistance songs, and it went, uh, um, you know, on the radios and on television across the world. And we were uh, very, it was very unexpected. This is pr probably the first time that Ukrainian song is played, um, you know, in, and played heavily um, in other countries. So, yes, um, uh, songs are important, culture is important, and it's, uh, it's, it's another tool of resistance. Thank you. Um, has it also helped, you know, unite um, the people of Ukraine through this crisis? I think it was not the um, only tool of unification, but yes, it was a tool of unification. I think Ukrainians have been united uh, the most, not by, the, um, by anything that was created right now, but by the common memory of trauma. Um, uh, basically, when Ukraine lost its independence 100 years ago, um, there were resistance fighters who kept on fighting. And then the Soviets decide, decided that they want to destroy this resistance with famine. And having, the famine was very, it was artificial and it killed anywhere between um, three and 11 million Ukrainians, you know, depending how you count uh, what you consider direct uh, victims and what you think were the indirect vic victims. Uh, you know, a death of famine in Ukraine is, is a shock by itself. Ukraine currently feeds um, uh, about 400 million people worldwide. You know, it's a breadbasket of the world. And famine in Ukraine is, is just, you know, just unbelievable. But we had it, and uh, then the memory of famine was forgotten, uh, was, was prohibited. Basically, the Soviets wanted Ukrainians to forget uh, the, the famine, and um, it, uh, uh, it lasted, this prohibition of any commemoration of the famine lasted for over 50 years. And uh, when it was finally released, it took some time for the people to 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 recognize what happened to them it was like a rape victim eventually understanding what was happening and uh, you know taking steps towards healing and then what would happen the popular culture the music the songs would address this pain and if i asked what defines a ukrainian a modern ukrainian right now that would probably be the empathy that you feel to each other because you know that the other person hurts as well and that the other person also feels a lot of pain and and because of this um uh, the attempt to overcome uh, is more symbolic it's 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 very important that people can actually express their feelings together and this is where culture comes in very handy thanks even um, Chris, let's come back home. Um, theater has been part of this story. We have had, you know, people who have written plays that some of them have been banned from theaters. We've had people who have come all out to really speak up against human rights violations. We've had people really, um, yeah, use theater as a tool for activism. Indeed, I, I agree with uh, Yevon that 
sometimes, I think most times, uh, culture and art is an effective weapon of, of the weak uh, when they're trying to respond to um, aggression by, by the strong. And indeed, in Uganda, again, my next story focuses on three individuals uh, who are you know, leading uh, theater actors and directors in Uganda. Uh, one is uh, Byron Kawadwa, um, the other is Robert Serumaga and Alex Mukulu. Of these three, uh, the first two are dead. Um, Alex Mukulu is around. Uh, Byron Kawadwa was killed by Idi Amin. Um, Robert Serumaga uh, narrowly escaped uh, death. But you know, there's, there's a popular story uh, told about how uh, Robert Serumaga uh, escaped death uh, from Amin secret police. Uh, Robert was a Ugandan playwright and uh, one-time minister in the administration of uh, Professor Yusuf Ule, that uh, it's the government that replaced Idi Amin uh, in 1979. And uh, during the, the year 1975, Uganda hosted the Organization of African Unity um, Summit. Uh, the Organization of African Unity is the African Union today. So uh, Uganda hosted the event and Idi Amin invited one of the leading playwrights in Uganda, who was uh, Robert Serumaga and his company, uh, the Abafumi Theatre Company, uh, to entertain the visiting heads of state from uh, all over Africa. So Robert Serumaga and his troupe uh, put up this play called Amayirikiti. Amayirikiti is uh, a Luganda word for the flame tree. And uh, in the play, there was a scene in which uh, the actors on stage dramatized the a helpless citizen being bundled into the boot of a car by soldiers and uh, being driven off to their death. Of course, uh, in, in the, in the write-up of the play, the scene was apparently in reference to what was happening in Africa, in South Africa that time under apartheid. So it took Amin's secret police a few days to realize that uh, the play was not about South Africa, but indeed what was happening under uh, Amin's reign in Uganda. By the time they discovered this, of course, <laughs> it was too late. The, the embarrassment had already been suffered by, by Amin's government. And uh, they launched a search for, for Robert Serumaga, who luckily had uh, gotten wind of uh, the impending arrest and managed to escape alongside uh, members of his theater company to uh, neighboring Kenya. Uh, uh, Byron Kawadwa, who was a contemporary of, uh, uh, of, of Robert Serumaga, however, was not uh, as lucky. Um, later, a couple of years later, in 1977, um, he hosted, he staged a, a popular play, um, a Luganda play called Oliimbalwa Wankoko, which in English is the song of uh, Mr. Cork. And uh, it was such a popular play that uh, it even won him recognition across the continent, and he was invited to perform at Festac uh, in 1977. Festac was uh, was a global uh, festival for 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 black and uh, African arts and culture, and that year's edition was in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. So uh, Byron Kawadwa and his troupe were sponsored by by the government of Idi Amin to to go and uh, and uh, stage this play in. Uh, in, in, in Lagos. Of course, the, the play was written as a social satire, um, but uh, I think learning from uh, uh, Robert Serumaga's uh, incident a few years earlier, this time around, uh, Amin's uh, secret police uh, were more keen on uh, what the play was about. And indeed, <laughs> they found that uh, it was a spoof of Amin's regime. Uh, so upon return from Lagos, uh, Byron Kawadwa was debriefing with members of uh, his team at the National Theatre, and uh, he was picked up by Idi Amin's uh, agents. And like had been portrayed in Robert Serumaga's play, he was put in the boot of a car and driven off. And uh, days later, his uh, body appeared in uh, Namanve Forest, which is on, on the outskirts of Kampala. And according to one of the troop members who was interviewed almost 30 years later by the, by the Daily Monitor, uh, she said that following uh, Kawadwa's death, uh, their group uh, never met again. And I think 
Ugandan theater um, also never recovered um, after that. So today, while you have um, comedians in theater, of course, there have been a number of, stage, uh, of staged plays by, by Alex Mukulu, who I think has tried to, to keep the flame of Ugandan theater. But I think uh, society has, has changed and the number of theater goers has dwindled. And I think also the state's focus on what is staged in theater has uh, kind of uh, shifted to some other, uh, some other platforms that include stand-up co uh, comedy, music shows that seem to attract larger audiences of, uh, uh, of Ugandans. But for me, my criticism today, and I, I hope in the room we have um, members of uh, the Ugandan Comedian Society or something like that. I was told by the organizers that would have some of the comedians. My, my own uh, view, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a personal opinion, I feel, is that um, the theater that was pioneered by people like uh, Serumaga and Kawadwa, who ultimately paid uh, with their lives to, to, to have that kind of uh, space, has largely uh, been betrayed by today's generation of comedians and artists who grace our national theater and um, other performing spaces, who I think have uh, reneged on their role as uh, the eyes and ears of society and seem to have found a soft spot in Ugandan minds for sexual content and tribal jokes, which constitutes a significant share of uh, you know, their performances. So, so that would be my, my ax to pick with them. But I think it may also speak to the changing times that society evolves and you know, uh, needs uh, change. So I'll, I'll stop at this point and maybe- Yeah, yeah, you. yeah, thanks so Chris. Can we give Chris um, a round of applause? See, Alex Mokulu did this song, Omsango Go You know it? It's, it's- Is it Namutamba? Namutamba, yes. I think it's Namutamba. You people need to go and listen to that song. I think he was the real, the, he was deliberate about what he was saying, you know, pointing things out as they are, not just, you know, sugarcoating it or making it difficult to understand. And he's clear that, look, you know, this is what's happening. You know, it, it's, I listen to that song literally every day. And, and I sometimes get to ask myself, so why don't we have more of these, right? Are artists are like, are artists scared? Are they, because I mean, you know, we, know, we don't have so many who can come out and do advocacy in that style, strong-hearted like the Alex Mokulus who will speak up whether you, you know, want to listen to him or not, he'll put it to you in the face. But rather, we are singing so much about love, 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 love. Instead of leveraging on the numbers and the platforms for them to be able to speak about social evils and that. And somehow then they coil their tails between their legs and take a back seat and concentrate more of entertainment rather than edutainment and indeed, you know, pushing the limits uh, you know, pushing back on, 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 on evil. Even you have the final say at this, and then I can open up the, 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 the panel to the, the audience to react and give their views and thoughts. Um, even, so I just wanted to come back to you on, on, you know, how the future looks like for Ukraine and for those in the social and cultural space especially in, 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 in getting actively involved in activism to push back on Russia's aggression on Ukraine? Well, um, Ukraine is um, uh, full of hope. And uh, that hope basically means that uh, once Russia is uh, out of Ukraine, Ukrainians can... Uh, uh, for the first time, uh, be fully in control of their own country. But that is not the end of the story. What will be important will be the uh, continuation of um, Ukraine's integration into the global world. And this is where Ukraine hits um, uh, many glass ceilings 
Uh, some of these glass ceilings have been part of the old colonial system. And uh, in a sense, Ukraine will be fighting to overcome these glass ceilings or shatter these glass ceilings. And in that sense, Ukraine can actually open up the path for other countries to follow. And uh, some of these countries are in, in uh, Europe. Some of these countries are in Asia. Uh, but some of these countries may be further out uh, in, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia, in uh, Africa, in Latin America. Basically, what the message of Ukraine to the world is that every country, no matter how small, uh, has the right. Every country has its own agency, and that agency has to be respected. And uh, we do not agree with the world where the strong powers somehow have the right to decide for others what they have to do and how they have to live. Uh, and uh, I think this is um, uh, the Ukraine's victory is an important step forward for everyone, for Ukrainians, for Ugandans, for, uh, you know, uh, people from equi uh, equatorial countries uh, of uh, South America, for uh, countries uh, in uh, Central Asia, uh, I think uh, Ukraine basically tells that everyone matters. Thanks a lot, Ivan. Thank you very much. Quest, do you have a conclusion? Sure. Uh, of course, uh, the examples I gave, the three, the musicians, uh, the cartoonists, and uh, uh, the playwrights, are in no way exhaustive of, uh, you know, champions of social change in Uganda, but I just use them to highlight that uh, at any one juncture, they've always, there's always been that movement, which you said is just emerging. It's always been there. And at any one time, different artists have, uh, have held up um, the society's torch for, for justice and, and freedom. My concluding thoughts are on uh, young people in Uganda today who constitute the majority of our population. Um, even I don't know what the, the statistic for Ukraine is, but Uganda today has about 44, 46 million people, of which uh, 12 million of them are on the internet, so they are internet users. Um, my own projections are that, based on the demographies, the majority of these 12 million online netizens uh, that we have uh, in Uganda were born prior to 1986, which is uh, 36 years ago. Of course, the figure is certainly bigger if you stretch it to include all those who were children in 1986 and had no idea what was happening around them um, in Uganda when uh, the NRA and, and President Museveni uh, marched into Kampala. So there's little wonder, therefore, that you know today we have such a significant backlash uh, whenever the president begins references in his speech with back in 1986, very many young Ugandans uh, switch off. And I think it's a message that our political class uh, needs to be alive to, that Uganda has had a difficult history, no, uh, no doubt about that, but also that Uganda has moved on. Uh, Uganda has changed a lot um, in these uh, 36 years. And now we need to look firmly um, into the future, we shouldn't uh, use the scare of what could have happened in the past to stop, uh, you know, people imagining what other possibilities um, exist out there uh, for the country. So many of these young people that I refer to as Museveni's babies, and President Museveni refers to as you know, young people he has, or his government have uh, immunized, in no way the regulatory word, but I feel these young people have an immense responsibility on their backs. And I belong to that generation, so I'm also including myself in that uh, reference. They have an immense responsibility uh, on their part to bravely look into the future and try to imagine a different Uganda, one that is not beholden to its past, that is not beholden to its uh, you know, differences, political differences, because just like Ivan has uh, explained uh, what is happening in Ukraine, I don't think we should wait for a moment of national crisis like that when your very sovereignty and existence is at stake to come together 
and start thinking of the kind of uh, uh, of the kind of country that we want to build. So that would be my key takeaway and key message to young people that you can draw from the Ukrainian experience and from Uganda's own, uh, Uganda's own history to say we need to work together regardless of our background as Ugandans to try and forge future together in which not only our sovereignty and independence today is secured, but also that of our children and their children. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much. It's your time to talk back. Um, and I want to invite Anna to moderate this session. And then we have my panel make a reaction and then we can have um, conclusions. You're welcome, Anna. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you, Kwezi. Thank you, Yevon. Can we just give a round of applause to our panelists for their contributions today? Thank you everyone for being here. I see some questions coming in online. Um, as usual, I think we have a new few new faces today. So um, just a recap for anyone who's new. Uh, we have about 20 to 25 minutes for questions today. I always try to balance between online and in-person questions and men and women. Um, and then I'm going to ask, since we have a little bit more limited time today for questions, and um, we'll have our Ukrainian guests sign off first, and we should have a little more time with Kwezi. Uh, if you have a question for Yevin specifically, let's prioritize those for our first question or two. Okay, um, we'll start with an in-person question. If you have an in-person question for Yevin, please raise your hand. Okay. And um, please state your name and just a reminder to keep your questions brief out of respect for everyone's time. Thank you, Anna. My name is Priscilla and this goes to you, Yvan. How has the state handled the voices of arts to be able to hear them, receive their message, but also have it conceived by the state? Um, I'm sorry, electricity just went off um, in uh, in where I am. I hope uh, the internet will 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 keep functioning. Um, the state is actually, um, uh, uh, I think, the state cannot moderate uh, the uh, these voices um, efficiently because the state has been basically relieved of the tools that uh, the Soviets had when Ukraine was still under autocratic control. Uh, so freedom of speech allows the voices to get through. Um, the social media platforms are powerful. Uh, the television that was under heavy influence of the politicians simply is not popular anymore. People don't watch TV, people use their smartphones and they use the content on uh, uh, their phones. So, so you know, if you get on phone, uh, then you you basically become um, uh, become uh, um, you have a chance for viral access. Um, and uh, the other thing, which is very clear domestically inside Ukraine, uh, for um, uh, for pretty much every government is that there is no way that you can control all the voices. So you have to you have to work with them. You have to deal with them. Um, Zelensky is a popular president. He doesn't like criticism. He doesn't handle criticism well. Uh, but he just had to um, live with the fact that people make fun of him as well, that people joke about him as well that he is in the cartoons. I think a lot of the voices have been silenced or self-silenced or self-censored during the war because uh, people uh, understand that unity is important at wartime. But I think the moment there is the end of the war, there will be a tsunami of criticism towards the president. And this is very typical of Ukraine. All right, thank you very much, uh, Yevon. It looks like your internet is holding up for now, so we're grateful for that for the moment. Um, actually, you just touched on a question that we got online. Um, you really provided a very natural segue. Uh, Teo Pista online um, is asking a question about Uganda. I think it's relevant to what you just shared as well. Uh, so perhaps you can provide your thoughts and then we'll turn it over to Kwezi and Solomon to provide their thoughts. The question is, 
Artists in Uganda and in Ukraine, which you just noted, are also censoring themselves because we've seen that those who do artwork on the state of affairs are arrested, followed, or heavy taxes are put on their businesses, et cetera. In such a state of affairs, what can be done? So I know not all of that may apply um, to the Ukrainian situation, Yevon, but we'll go to you and then um, Solomon, I'll turn it over to you. Well, we had journalists killed. We had uh, the deaths of the prominent um, leaders of public opinion. Um, I don't think we ever had a situation, or I wouldn't say ever, we had, for instance, famous uh, songwriters killed um, uh, in Soviet time because they were singing in Ukrainian and the Soviets didn't want, didn't want anyone to, uh, to be popular in Ukrainian language. Um, so so uh, they would kill artists uh, or they would imprison artists. Independent Ukraine doesn't persecute um, uh, people like the Soviets did, but still in the early years of independence, we had uh, famous journalists killed, uh, investigative journalists persecuted. And um, uh, uh, I would say that Ukraine still has a mixed record of, uh, um, with, with regards to uh, freedom of speech, even though it's probably um, it moving to the better uh, right now. And um, it's becoming more and more um, uh, clear to the government that when they um, uh, target the opponents in the civil society, or if they target the opponents who are artists, or if they target the opponents who are um, um, creators, the backlash will be worse than the initial problem. So um, uh, in that sense, they basically have to cope with criticism and, uh, you know, live with it. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, there is a danger that um, 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 if we do not have democracy basically in, I don't know, in our DNA, if we do not believe that democracy is the uh, ultimately better system, then the risk is that someone will monopolize culture, someone will monopolize media or access to internet or you know other tools, and uh, uh, try to create the you know digital or modern uh, uh, autocracy. Uh, the risks are always there, and this is why it's very important that um, people through educational system, through upbringing, through um, uh, um, you know, public discourse and uh, pop culture um, understand the importance of uh, diversity, understand the importance of um, minority protection, understand the importance of freedom of speech, because if we do not have that, then, um, you know, our other achievement, achievements basically don't matter then we will not be able to distribute wealth uh, in, uh, in a fair way, then we will not be able to achieve better quality of life, then we will not be able to be happy in the end. Quiz, uh, thank you, uh, Solomon. I think the, the question is uh, quite a loaded one. I don't have a straightforward answer. Um, much as I'm um, keenly interested in the arts, I'm, I'm not an artist myself, but I think there are lessons that can be drawn from other spheres, uh, like the media in Uganda. One important lesson uh, from all this is that um, your rights and your dignity uh, cannot be given to you. It's always a constant struggle. And I think the media freedom that exists in Uganda is by and large a product of efforts by um, Ugandan uh, uh, journalists and uh, the judiciary and many other actors uh, within the state. The Ugandan journalists successfully led uh, to the repealing of uh, Section 50 of our penal code, which was an old colonial law um, that would prosecute you for uh, sedition or for you know, publishing false news. Can you imagine? This was as 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 long ago as uh, sixty years ago. This was a law on uh, on our books, and it persisted. 
until the early 2000s when uh, Charles Onyango Bo and others um, successfully led a charge um, that had the section of uh, the section 50 of our penal code um, repealed. So the same applies to, to artists that um, whatever extra freedoms um, you want to, to obtain can only come from struggle. And I think there's uh, been efforts in the past uh, we've seen unity by by the artists when, for example, uh, it was being claimed that the National Theatre, the land where it sits, was going to be given to a developer. We saw um, the artists come together and put up a spirited fight. I think we'll need more of uh, such show of unity if we are to make significant progress. Certainly. Okay, any more questions? Anna, maybe you can take one more. Okay, um, I uh, actually have a question for both Yevin and Kwezi, and then I think we'll have time for one more question from the audience. So the question is, um, I think you both touched on this a bit, but could you speak about, well, I'll preface this with, in the news and the media um, early in the war, there was a lot of conversation around the role that the internet and was playing in people's insight into what was going on in the war. And that included a lot of artistic and cultural um, content uh, in the form of protests and also just um, you know, Ukrainians producing art related to the war and that generated you know, quite an emotional reaction for people across the world. So I'm curious if um, Yevin, you could speak a little bit to the role of the internet in the arts, um, since this is a you know, relatively new development globally and how it's affected the outcome of the war in Ukraine so far. And then Kwesi, maybe you could speak a little bit to the relationship between the internet and the arts in Uganda. And then we'll have time for one more audience question. Thanks, Anna. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Kwesi. No, I was just saying, do you want to start? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, this is one of the uh, internet penetration is one of the areas where Ukraine has actually benefited from the African experience, uh, because um, um, uh, in Africa, uh, the infrastructure, um, uh, the digital infrastructure was new, um, uh, and uh, it basically didn't have to wait until the analog infrastructure would be worn off. Uh, this is exactly what happened in Ukraine. Um, uh, basically, a new digital infrastructure was created, and it was very decentralized. Basically, the government um, uh, didn't try and control all the major lines, uh, so um, major uh, internet connections were private and very decentralized. A lot of uh, small companies operate as providers that allowed the internet to be easily accessible pretty much everywhere, and cheap. And uh, that meant that most Ukrainians are internet users. Uh, and um, when the uh, mobile phone operators started um, uh, becoming more digital oriented, they were already competing on a field market. So uh, internet is available. As you see right now, we don't have electricity, but we have internet. We can talk. Um, and. Uh, uh, I'm right now in a I'm right now in a shelter because the it's it's we had the air uh, um, uh, uh, siren uh, about an hour and a half ago just as we started uh, so I went down to the basement uh, of the building and this is where I'm talking from so the electricity is off something happened probably because the, the there was news that um, infrastructure was bombed but um, internet is on it's a it's a very dense grid and it's very difficult to to basically disrupt it because it's so dense um, and because there are so many private players they basically overlap they stabilize themselves and um, this is another example how entrepreneurship uh, works well with infrastructure and that uh, if you allow only huge monopolies to do the job, they usually fail and they become uh, tools of political op oppression. Uh, the fact that internet is so cheap and it's so widely available, 
allows actually the artists to appeal to huge audiences because um, you know they can easily uh, get to the audience through YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or uh, TikTok or other means. Uh, you know, depending depending on where their audience is. Um, so I think, um, um, and basically, you know, the the philosophy the philosophy of um, internet banking, the philosophy of creation of a brand new infrastructure instead of trying to rely on the old infrastructure, was in great uh, part brought by the uh, executives who were um, uh, who had experience prior experience in Africa. And who came to Ukraine and said, "Don't do not try to, re, you know, revamp the old infrastructure. Just create brand new one, and you will be better off." And uh, I think this is one of the cases where we followed um, the African experience, and we were happy with the outcome. Wow, it's quite interesting that even when there's no power, you still have internet. You're in an basement. Um, I'm, I'm saddened that there are bombings happening. Yeah, so I hope you're safe, my brother. All right, Quez, you want to attempt that? Yeah, the the role of uh, the internet. Yeah, the internet is, uh, of course, a, a powerful tool. Um, question becomes powerful tool in whose hands? Um, because as we know, um, the internet is not neutral. Uh, I think the perfect analogy would be um, a knife. If you have a knife in your kitchen, it's a necessity. If you take the knife out of your house and onto the street, it becomes a dangerous weapon. So the internet, in, allow, in as far as allowing us to connect, to um, you know, understand what's happening on the other side of the world, is an important tool uh, for, for, you know, for democracies across the world but also for social movements across the world, like we see with uh, uh, climate change activists. Um, many of them in remote corners of the world never met perhaps, but they only know about each other's work through the internet and they collaborate through the internet. But the flip side of that uh, is the role of the internet in diverting democracy or diverting people's choices. As we saw with the election interference in, in the US, as um, uh, closer to home, we saw with Cambridge Analytica and their role in the Kenyan election. And we're now only beginning to realize the extent of, uh, of those interruptions. Uh, we now know that Cambridge Analytica could have actually influenced many other elections and decisions on the African continent. We're also very much alive to the ongoing information and propaganda campaigns in countries like uh, Central African Republic, Mali, where you have uh, the Wagner Group and all. So these are serious front lines. They, uh, you don't have missiles flying over and people in, best, uh, in, in bunkers, but there's an ongoing um, information warfare. Um, and many of these African states are on the front line. So my caution would be that the internet needs to be looked at very carefully because it can be a very important tool when used very well. It can also be a very effective weapon if it's in the hands of uh, the wrong entity. Well, I can't agree more um, with that. I think what we saw was the wave, you remember, the, the wave in the Middle East, Egypt, Tunisia, was also well-coordinated online. Anna. Thank you both. Um, we have time for one more brief audience question out of respect for our speaker's time. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question in the in-person audience? Okay, yes, sir. Please state your name and your question. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm Makanga Alex, President, Ukraine Student Committee, Uganda, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, please, brother Yuven, send my greetings to the people of Ukraine and President Zelensky. Uh, now, on your earlier submissions, uh, you said Russia undermined Ukraine and Ukrainian willingness to defend their sovereignty and integrity. Uh, to my belief, I believe it has been the culture and social setting of the Ukrainians which has helped them more alongside other support from other 
allies to have made it. Now, uh, my question is, what are those special? If we look at any other social setting, like if we serve religions, Islam, Christians, they have principles, binding principles, which give, make them more stronger and more, give them more strength. What are those principles in the culture and social setting of Ukraine, which has made them more stronger and more courage to defend their strength, their sovereignty integrity? If they are applicable, we can also adopt them and use them here in Uganda for our future uh, exercises, as far as democracy and good governance are concerned. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think generally um, Ukrainians don't like to fight. Uh, at the times of our history, when we had to fight, we had mixed record. We would win some fights, we would lose the others. Um, but uh, uh, generally, as I said before, trauma was uh, the uh, common denominator, it was the common experience that we all had. And empathy worked as a very important binding factor for different groups. Ukraine has a Christian um, a population, but also a lot of um, Muslims, a lot of Jews, a lot of um, uh, people who uh, have uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, even though majority of Ukrainian of Ukraine uh, are Ukrainians, but uh, you would have um, uh, people of other nations uh, widely present. Uh, you would also have Ukrainians who would speak Ukrainian language, but there would be also people who would speak Russian language. So um, you have a mixture of identities, religions, nationalities, um, all in one country. And uh, the Russians were trying to put certain groups against other groups, and um, that didn't work. Um, basically, um, I would say that empathy and the, um, the approach of that, uh, I feel your pain, brother, so I will not cause more pain, was the important uh, um, uh, general assumption that uh, people had towards each other. And I think this is a very strong uh, bonding ground. Um, it's a good question, what will happen with us uh, once we are past our trauma, once we are past our traumatic experience? And Ukraine has had tremendous trauma. You know, uh, it's, I just talked about the famine. We also had terrible Second World War. Also, Chernobyl nuclear explosion was in Ukraine in 1986. You know, so there was um, one catastrophe after the other in recent history. And um, uh, that empathy actually is uh, in the basis of nonviolent approach. It, it takes time to make Ukrainians angry enough that they take arms into their hands because we had so many people lost. And, you know, you were talking about how many um, uh, people live in Uganda. We had 52 million people in Ukraine 30 years ago. We are now about 35 to 37 million. We will be around 30 million in year 2030, and we will be going down. Um, uh, partially because parents are cautious to bring new life uh, into this world, and most parents uh, try to have only one child. And, uh, and this is terrible because the reason why they are doing so is because they are afraid that somehow the terrible experience will come back. This is why this victory that Ukrainian army has uh, on the battlefield is so important because it's a, it's basically a tipping point in our history. And this is why um, empathy and willingness to, um, to accept each other across the div dividing lines of religion, of language, of ethnicity, um, uh, of uh, race is so important uh, for Ukrainians. Thank you so much, Evan. That was a very powerful closing statement, if I do say so myself. Um, with that, I think we have run out of time for our panelists. I would like to take a moment to thank Evan for joining us from a basement in the dark. Can we please give him a round of applause? Thank you so much.
Um, I want to thank Quezzy for being here today and creating some links for us between Uganda and Ukraine. Can we give him a round of applause, please? And Solomon for being here. Every time we've had a Dignity Dialogues to moderate and help bring all the pieces together. A round of applause for him, please. All right, thank you, Yevon. With that, we will say farewell and thank you very much. Um, we wish you all the best and uh, feel free to sign off at your convenience. <laughs>